Jesus did not come so people far from God could find him. He came to find people who were far from God. There are many ways to get lost, but there is one way to be found, through the message and ministry of Jesus. And once Jesus finds you, he bids you to join him in his search and rescue mission. The greatest act of love is to help someone find Jesus. That is why we ask you to find your one. Good morning. Welcome to the Hills. If you're watching online or in person at one of our three campuses in Tarrant County, I am thrilled that you are here. My name is Rick. I'm the senior teaching minister here at the Hills. Uh, in the month of July, I was on a study break. I got to read a lot of books for future sermon series and visit some church plants, travel out of the state. Now that I'm back in Texas, I just have two words. It's hot. <laughs> Man, it's been hot in Texas this summer and dry. For most of us, it's frustrating. For some, it's devastating. For those with meager means, and the cost associated with this kind of heat has been hard. For those whose future depends on the raising of crops or livestock, it has been a terrible summer. The scripture says that when a land needs rain, the people who love God need to ask for it. What would happen if thousands of us this week just prayed every day for rain? Let's do that right now. Would you bow with me, please? So God, it's hot. It's hot and it's dry. It's been miserable. For a lot of us, it's just uncomfortable. But for some, God, this is unsustainable. Their resources are suffering. Their livestock and their crops are failing. God, we confess we have not always been good stewards of your creation. But it is your creation. It is good. You love it. So God, show mercy on your creation and on your people, and send rain. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, full disclosure, while I was on study break, I did visit some of our church plants on the West Coast where it was much cooler. It was refreshing to escape the heat, but it was more refreshing to be with these resilient church planters. Beginning churches in a very secular culture with meager means, and a pandemic has been hard on them. It's almost like they get started, they have to shut down, and they have to relaunch. And I was inspired by their faith and their persistence. Uh, three weeks ago, I got to be with Kyle and Ruth Davies at Generations Church just outside of Portland, Oregon. And then two weeks ago, I was with Josh and Courtney Searcy in Seattle, Washington, Icon Church is full of kids and energy. And then last week I was in Santa Barbara, Mission City Church, led by Sean and Jayla Dilbeck and their family. And uh, I even got to preach for them, and it was a wonderful experience. And all of our church planters send greetings, but more than that, they say thank you. In fact, they say the hills sets the bar for how to help church planters. By the way, we don't just send money but we send encouragement and we send people resources. You see, we have been doing this a long time as a church. In fact, our current church vision is to help start 15 new churches across America in the next five years. And it's hard and it's expensive. That's why every fall we ask for several million dollars in our harvest offering. Why? Why start new churches? Why ask for nations and generations? Well, a core conviction of our church is that everyone needs one who knows Jesus. Because everyone needs Jesus. And so often you hear us around the hills ask the question, who's your one? We believe God has put in the path of every one of you that follows Jesus, someone who needs Jesus. Sometimes in our baptistry, you will hear someone smile and beam and say, this is my one. See, we believe that faithfulness to the Jesus that we know demands an unapologetic relentlessness in the search for anyone who does not know 
Jesus. That was his mission. He said in Luke 19, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So in the month of August, I prepared some teachings for you to talk about how we can join Jesus in the mission of looking for the one who is lost. And right off the bat, we got to get something out on the table. The word lost has become uncomfortable around many Christians. We've used a lot of different words now instead of the word lost to describe people that are far from God, which is ironic because it is the single word that Jesus used more than any other word to describe people far from God. I think there are several reasons we might explore, but here's the main one. Because lost implies value. I do not lose things I don't care about. I don't lose paper clips. I don't lose rubber bands. If I am walking to my car with a handful of change and I drop a penny and it rolls under my car, I do not get down on my hands and knees to get that penny. Now, if it's a quarter, I might. <laughs> because the truth is, the more I value something, the more I will sacrifice to search for it. A few weeks ago, I was playing golf, and because of the drought, they weren't allowing the carts to drive on the fairway. So my cart is on one side of the fairway. My ball is on the complete other side. I didn't know how far I was from the green. So I had to grab two clubs and just guess and walk over there. I surmise what I need. I pick a club. I put the other on the ground. I hit my shot. I walk off. I leave my club. Two holes later, I discover what I have done. In that moment, the only thing that mattered, where is my lost club? I had a bag full of good clubs, but I dropped everything and went back and found my lost club. Because here's what you know. When something you really value is lost, you don't concern yourself with what is unlost. Simple illustration. When Jamie and I were young parents, on more than one occasion, we lost one of our kids. Don't you dare judge me. You have to. <laughs> you're at a mall. You're at a sporting event. You're out hiking in the woods, and you've lost a kid. In that moment, you got a new job description. Nothing else matters but finding that one lost child. Jesus said, I am on mission, sent by the Father, to seek his lost children. It was mission critical to Jesus. And it was the reason many were critical of Jesus. Because if you're looking for something that is lost, you have to be in places where lost things are. So we're going to use Luke 15 as a platform for this series where Jesus uses the word lost all the time. And it starts like this. Some people are critical of Jesus for who he's hanging out with. If you're so good, why do you hang out with bad people? And Jesus tells stories. And every story is about something that's lost. A lost sheep, a lost coin a lost son. And all these stories have the same point. Nothing matters more than finding someone who is lost. That's a bold statement. I don't back up or back off it. Nothing matters more than finding someone who is lost. And what you see in this chapter as we study is there's more than one way to be lost. Jesus knows that. In fact, next week, he talks about a lost coin. Coins don't get lost on their own. Somebody loses them. Somebody drops them. Some people are lost. They're far from God because of the way they got treated by other people. And we'll talk about that. And then we're going to talk about the rebel, the person that shakes their fist at God and says, I don't need you and I don't want you, and they run away. That's another way to be lost. And then on the last lesson, 
We're going to talk about the person that is far from the Father but never left the Father's house. You can be incredibly religious and be lost. But I think most people, most people are more like a sheep. They get lost without even realizing that's what's happening. Listen to the first story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that he lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. You see, people are really good at getting lost. And one of the most common ways it happens is that people just, they just unintentionally wander away. You know somebody like that. You know somebody who has made a wreck of their life and they never meant to. They never meant to have an affair that blew up their marriage and their family. Never meant to. They never meant to have a drinking problem. If they could see where it was going to lead, they wouldn't have never started They didn't intend to become a workaholic. They didn't mean to drift from God. It just kind of happened. And now they look up and they think, how did I get here? How did I get to a place I never meant to be? So what do you do? When you find somebody in a place they never meant to be. When you know someone who's found themselves in a place they never thought they would wind up. Here's what you do. You go find them. You go find them and you go friend them. Because that's what Jesus did. And so each week we're going to look at a story in the Gospels where Jesus is going to show us how to look for the lost. And the first story is of a man who wound up in a place he never thought he would be. The name is Levi. Luke chapter 5. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Now, Jesus went to a lot of party. It seemed like every time Jesus was at a party, a pooper would show up. <laughs> and the poopers at this party don't understand why you're hanging out with these kind of people. If you're a good guy, why do you hang out with bad people? See, they had lost sight of God's affection for lost people. It happens. In fact, reading books for this series, I was appreciated the candor of one of the authors who just admitted the reason I don't look for lost people is I don't like sinners. I think that's where more of us are than we want to admit. I like to be around people I like, not around people who are nothing like me. So before my wife and I came to this church. We worked with a church in Abilene, Texas. We had some new neighbors. He was a pilot in the Air Force named Mike. He loved golf. I like golf. We became friends. We played golf together. 
And Mike invited another friend to join us one day named Fred. Fred was far from God. He grew up nominally Catholic, left it as soon as he left home. Everything from his language to his lifestyle was completely different than me. But I just felt God impress it upon me. Be his friend. And so whenever Fred was willing, I would play golf with Fred. After some time, Fred actually accepted an invitation to come to my home for a weekly Bible study. Even later, he started attending the church somewhere I would preach. And then the Air Force sent Fred on deployment to Europe for three months. When he came back, I called. They didn't have cell phones then. I just had to call him up. I hadn't talked to him in three months. Hey, Fred, next Tuesday night, we want you to come back to our home for our Bible study. I have no blankety-blank interest in that blankety-blank, blankety-blank that you're teaching people and your blankety-blank faith, blankety-blanket. <laughs> I knew exactly what had happened. You see, while he was away in Europe, Fred had drifted back into the lifestyle he knew before he met me, dark and wicked. But see, he had tasted Jesus and now that lifestyle was filling him with guilt and he was dealing with tension. I said, Fred, I'm sorry that you don't want to come. I understand. So what day next week can we play golf? And there was a pause and then a question. Do you still want to play golf with me? I said, Fred, we are still friends. One week later, we played golf. Two weeks later, he came to our house for Bible study. <laughs> Six weeks later, he confessed Jesus and got baptized. And I learned a very important lesson. I'm not going to find many people who need Jesus if I'm not going to be a friend to people who need Jesus. I have got to get better at learning to like people who are nothing like me if I'm going to be like Jesus. So we're going to look at this story and Jesus is going to teach us how to be friends with the one he wants us to find. And here's the first thing we learn that we see patience, not problems. You ever notice that Jesus seemed to attract a lot of people with pre-existing conditions? And that's because Jesus saw people with problems. He didn't see people as problems. He didn't see people as labels. Uh, it says that he saw people harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And so he focused on their helplessness, not on their sinfulness. Here's the thing. If you find a sheep that got lost, you don't pick up a stick and start beating it and saying, what a stupid sheep. When you meet somebody that is sick, you don't chew them out for not being well. Even if they made choices that contributed to their illness. Here's the thing. Most sick people don't want to be where they are. Most lost people don't either. Levi did not, as a little Jewish boy, have the goal of his life, I want to be the most hated person in town. He was in a place he never wanted to be when he was younger. How did he get there? There's always a story. Was he an orphan? Did he have a sick child and a lot of bills he could find no other way to pay? Did he have a disability and he couldn't get a job that required manual labor? Every patient has a story. And when you learn it, you become more patient with them. You see, people far from God drew close to Jesus because they sensed he likes me. He doesn't just tolerate me. He values me. Because Jesus never said to anyone, you 
got here by yourself and you can get right on your own. What Jesus said was, I'm a doctor and I am ready to walk with you if you want to leave where you are. See, that's the second thing Jesus teaches us about being a friend. That you got to stay near, not far. When you think about the metaphors that Jesus used for joining his mission, they all have the same basic idea, like being a fisherman. He said, I'll make you fishers for people. You people that fish know you don't sit on the couch to wait for the fish to knock on the door. You go where the fish are. And if a sheep gets lost, you don't stay home and hope it finds its way back. You leave the found sheep and you go to the wilderness where the lost sheep might be. You see, Jesus is not calling the lost to go to church. He's calling his church to go and find the lost. Now, I know we need to give a word of caution here. I know there is a verse in the Bible that says bad company corrupts good morals. I know there's a verse in the Bible that says blessed is the man that doesn't walk in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. I know that. I know that we have to be conscious of a person's particular area of weakness. If you deal with alcoholism, you do not need to go out for drinks after work to witness to your friends about Jesus. I know that when kids are young, they're growing in faith. And we need to be very careful who their friends are going to be because they're not strong enough yet to handle peer pressure. I know all that, but I also know that Jesus didn't believe that separation from sin meant total isolation from sinners. What kind of doctor avoids going to a hospital because that's where sick people are? During the pandemic, didn't we have great respect for the medical professions? They put on their mask. They went to the most contagious Because that is where a doctor belongs. And so we were lost. What did heaven do? Heaven didn't send condemnation. Heaven responded with incarnation. Heaven became us to come find us. The Son of Man came to seek Stop using the word seeker for people far from God. The followers of Jesus are supposed to be the seekers. That's why Christians need to be everywhere people far from God are. We need to be in the schools. We need to be in law enforcement. Christians need to be in government. We don't need a church softball league. We need some dudes to get together with a couple of friends and go form a team and play in a rec league and meet some people that don't know Jesus. We need Christians in all the noble professions. Levi would never have come after Jesus if Jesus had not first come after Jesus. Levi, and that's why you'll notice in our vision to ask for nations and generations, we are calling on all of us to go and be friends with people who need to meet our friend Jesus. We're asking you to go Academy 4 and mentor a fourth grader and be in the schools to advocate for asylum seekers that God is bringing to our city. To consider adoption and fostering. We need to be where people who don't know Jesus are. And here's why. Because every now and then someone who is in a place they never meant to be decide, I don't want to stay here. And they got to call somebody. And you want that call. You want to be the friend who gets the first call when someone decides, I don't want to be here anymore. 
And when you get that call, here's what you say. You say start, not stop. You notice that Jesus called the absolute worst version of Levi. Not cleaned up Levi. Far from God, Levi. He didn't say, I'm so disappointed in you. Look where you are. You're on probation. I'm going to come back in a month. If you have cleaned up your act, you can join my team. He just walked up right where he was, said, start following me. And that's good news. <laughs> it is good news that I am does as is. And you know what I mean. You've been to a thrift store. You've seen a rack of clothes as is. You know what that means. It means the shirt's going to have a stain. It means the pants are going to have a rip in them. Although I'm old, I don't understand today if a pant has a rip in them, they're more expensive. I don't get that. But you know what I mean. As is means you know there's a flaw. I am does as is. This church is full of people who belong on the as is rack. Amen. In fact, doesn't that give some context to the charge often made? Well, the church is just full of hypocrites. What? Are you telling me this church is full of sinners? It better be. <laughs> We're all sick. I've been pastoring this church for over 30 years. I'm telling you, you're sick. In fact, turn to your neighbor right now and say this. Say, don't feel bad. I'm sicker than you are. <laughs> now, I know the church has hypocrites in it because there's some people that are sick and they're so vain and proud they won't admit it. Some people are sick and their heart is so rebellious they don't care. But most people in church are sick and Jesus is helping them get better. They've started following and they're not where they used to be. I've told the story several years ago. There was a documentary by CBS on TV about life in prison. Prisoners are the most resourceful people in the world. They're not allowed to have cigarettes. They're given nicotine gum to break their habit. They take the residue from the gum. They mix it with tea leaves, roll it up in paper, and they have something to smoke. And in the documentary, the prisoner said, now our paper, we get to write letters, burns too fast. So we found the pages of the Bibles they give us smoke better. <laughs> so this one guy named Robert said, I smoked Matthew. I smoked Mark. I smoked Luke. And then I got to John and found that Jesus loves me. And I stopped smoking. You see, people don't need lectures about their past. They need hope for the future. And our mission is not to fix people. Our mission is to find people and introduce them to Jesus. And say, he's pretty cool. You should start following him. Because people don't change and then follow Jesus. People start following Jesus and they begin to change. Everyone without Jesus is helpless, but no one is hopeless. Any one can become Jesus' friend. I don't care who they are. I don't care where they currently are. Any one can become Jesus' friend. And our church is full of people who learned that lesson. One of them is named Manuel. Manuel met Jesus in solitary confinement at Tarrant County Jail. And he became friends. Listen to his story. Well, my name is Manuel Galindo. I guess I got into some trouble over some things that I said. And I ended up in uh, TCC, which is Tarrant County Jail. I ended up in, a bad, in solitary confinement, actually. And I met a man who was in a cell not too far from me. 
was being ministered to by the hills. You know, at, at that time I really needed it because uh, me and that man, he was reading those, the mail that he was getting, he was reading it to me. And he was, uh, you know, he was ministering to me actually. It really changed my life because I learned about forgiveness and to lose all this hatred and stuff that I knew I couldn't carry around with me. And I know, learned that I had to forgive people, you know, those that have wronged me, those who have, you know, did me wrong. And uh, in order for me to be better, I had to forgive. I was lost, and that's what brought me to this point and where I'm, I'm now faithfully follow with Jesus Christ. I now serve, I now greet here. Uh, I do three English services and one Spanish service. I really give a lot of thanks to the Hills Church for accepting me and showing me that they are, because for a long time I didn't believe that there were people who cared, to tell you the truth. But they have shown me love and kindness and showing me that there's a better way of life. Okay, this is something that reminds me of uh, of the goodness of God. And it says, uh, what do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away? Will he not leave the 99 on the hill and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, he truly, I tell you, he is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. And what that is just really touched my heart about that. And I feel like I'm that one that he saved. And I thank you, Lord, for that. Amen. Isn't that good news? And so Jesus met Manuel in a place he never intended to be. They became friends. He started following. And there's more to the story because this morning at 8.30 at the North Hills campus, Manuel took his next step. Watch this. Good morning, church. This is uh, my friend and one, Manuel. Galindo, you heard his testimony. Uh, God has been pursuing Manuel for a long time. Uh, he was lost. I first met Manuel about uh, six, seven years ago in uh, solitary confinement in Tarrant County Jail. Eight by 10 cell, uh, a man who was angry. He was confused. He was sad. Uh, scared. All of these emotions uh, were going through his mind. He, he questioned God, didn't know why he was here, didn't understand all that was going on in his life, but God was pursuing him. God was pursuing him. And so we met with Manuel uh, over the course of several months. Uh, his first, those first few months that we were meeting with him, uh, his prayers were for himself. Why me, God? Uh, look at me, all the things about me. As time went on, as we talked about forgiveness, as we talked about uh, God's love for him, he, his, his heart softened. And, I, and his prayers were for his family, for his mom, who's here today, for his children, for his grandchildren, uh, a granddaughter who was uh, dealing with physical sickness and, and problems, so his, his heart was changing. We followed him on to prison. He said, please don't forget me when I go to prison. We didn't. We stayed with him. We sent him Rick's lessons uh, every week. Uh, we sent him information that uh, would encourage him. God was there with him, uh, cared for him, watched out for him, and protected him until about a, two or three weeks before he, he came home, uh, he said to me, sent me a letter and said, David, I want to come back and serve. I want to give back now. And so that's what he's been doing. You've seen him at the greeting tables, meeting and greeting uh, for the last couple of years. That's what he's been doing. And so he is uh, living now.
who he wants to serve, and that's Jesus Christ. And so, Manuel, in front of your family, in front of your church family, I want to ask you a few questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's son? Yes. Do you believe that he came to earth, lived as a man, died for your sins? Yes. And do you desire for him not only to be your savior, but to be the Lord of your life for the rest of your life? Yes. Based on that confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me tell you how God orchestrates things. I did not know when Manuel gave that testimony that he was going to wear that shirt that said Matthew 18, 12. He did not know I was going to preach on the text I preached on today. Do you know what Matthew 18, 12 says? What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills? And go to look for the one that wandered away. You see, it's not really a story about a lost sheep. It's a story about a good shepherd. It's a story about a God that loves to throw parties. And it's a call to join this God in finding his lost children. And when you go and you look and you make friends with people far from God, you are thanking God who left everything to come find you. So I want everyone to bow your head. We're going to pray. I'm going to give you three prayers. You just choose one of them. Some of you need to pray this prayer. God, thank you for finding me. I was lost. I was far away. I was in a place I never meant to be. And you found me. And that's your prayer today. Thank you, God. Some of you need to pray this prayer. God, I need wisdom and courage to be a better friend to someone in my path that doesn't know Jesus. That's your prayer. Some of you need to pray this prayer. Oh God, I'm sick of being where I am. I never meant to get here and I don't know how to get out. I need help. Please show me how to get home. That's your prayer. Pick one of those three and pray right now. Oh, God, you alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, and you led us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise, and we offer it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.